And here we go, opening Saturday card of the winter season at Gulfstream Park. And once again, we couldn't ask Mother Nature for a nicer day in the weather department as we uh, gaze upon that live shot at 11 a.m. Eastern on the nose. Another five palm tree out of five in the weather department today. And pristine conditions both on the main and this expansive, almost double-wide turf course that's going to see plenty of action over the next few hours. Our opening Saturday program, our first 11 race card of the winter meet. Jason Blewett, Ron Nicoletti, glad to have all of you with us. And we're starting a little early today, Ronnie, as opposed to the last couple of cards because there's 11 races today and a first race post coming up in a little more than an hour's time. Yeah, we got an 11 race con and that first race post, as you mentioned, is at noon, just at noon. If we're direct, you know, so make sure we don't have too much drag anymore it's at this track. So uh, make sure you get your wagers in. What a great, great day of racing it is today. It really is. I don't feel it's hyperbole to say this is more or less a Breeders' Cup type day for the claiming horses, uh, many of which are just quite simply the backbone of the industry. And we're near and dear to many familiar faces on today's card. And that goes for both the four-legged athletes and the two-legged athletes because we do welcome a number of top riders back to the colony today. And for the likes of a Tyler Gaffleone and a Rod Ortiz Jr. in particular, their winter meets start this afternoon. In fact, I think they ride all 11 races, both of those guys, in addition to Louis Saez and Edgar Zayas and Paco and the rest of the, uh, the top Robbie riders too, Robbie Alvarado. Yeah, Robbie, who's coming to Gulfstream Park, maybe with a little, little mojo. Obviously, I think Swiss Skydiver and her Preakness win a little more than a month ago, almost two months ago now, kind of a, a late career pick-me-up, if you will. Yeah, you know, you want to follow Swiss Skydiver wherever she goes, so uh, maybe we'll be seeing Swiss Skydiver run here. So uh, I would hope so yeah. in 2021. I know the plan is to bring her back as a four-year-old, which is great news all around. Great news as well if you were smart enough and maybe lucky enough to have uh, navigated your way through all five legs in yesterday's Stronic Five. Our good buddy Swifty took it down. He was one of a few people that hit it for over $3,600 dollars for a one dollar price and nothing outside of a uh, Cherie DeVoe's horse who ran a hole in the wind in our, our featured ninth race on the turf the rest of it Ronnie was a very formful sequence yeah and the 3600 just a fantastic payoff for that like you said if you could have made Cherie uh with just going to the lead with MSC El Jaramillo you got the ticket and uh we got the uh, other two legs and the Laurel did a good job you got the favorites basically up there looked like all gray horses ran up there yesterday <laughs> yeah. to me which I like that we were we were joking watching Ronnie and I watching the uh, Stratic Five races from Maryland with all of you. I mean, we were watching them live before we <laughs> came on the air locally at Gulfstream, and I was saying I remember being a kid, or at least in my early teens, uh, and, and I think the Meadowlands had the Grey Ghost handicap on Halloween where you had to be a, a Grey Horse or a Roan uh, to run in that race, <laughs> and uh, yeah, no, good to see the Greys out there. I'm sure we've got uh, quite a few of them running over the next uh, few races here, 11 in fact, as uh, we get settled in and focus in off the bat, not only on that early pick five, but a lot of, lot of dough in this uh, quarter of a million dollar uh, guaranteed jackpot Rainbow Six. That is a, a claiming crown exclusive Rainbow Six. You've got uh, uh, six stakes, in fact, uh, led, of course, by Jesus's team in the first leg, and Ronnie will have his ticket momentarily. I'll dive into the pick five, and I'll take a little swing, including the favorite in the first, who I do think the number three uptown flirt is the Philly to beat in this one for Bill Mott. Yet her races to date have just been okay. They've been solid but I'm, I'm also looking at some first-time starters to run well, including uh, Graham's a Flaxman horse on the rail. I love Flaxman Holdings and, and their homebreds, and, and they've got one on the, uh, on the rail. It's currently 9-1 to one with Louie, and you've got the uh, Ramsey Maker horse and uh, Partisan Kitten uh, who's liable to run well with, uh, with a Rod Ortiz. Defending winner of the Glass Slipper, Liza Starr, is the mare to beat as it stands in the second. I don't know if she's as good as she was a year ago when she won this race. And I don't fully trust her. I respect her. She's a terrific, uh, battle-hardened mare, but I also think the number six, uh, Sky Chaser, is going to run very well for Ron Spatz. You know, Ronnie, the only other, and I, by the way, I, I capped the ticket with the uh, number 10 horse in the, uh, in the fifth race. That is uh, Mike Baker's horse in Jakarta, who's been running against just uh, obviously 
a a much better much better series of races and higher higher races, and including got Stormy a couple of races back. Uh, but anyway, you know, singling her Jacquard in the back end ticket. You know, as I was saying, Ronnie, I mean, races one and three are the only two non claiming crown races on the card, yet they're both basically you know maxed out maiden turf races. So we're in good shape here. Yeah, it, it is a great sequence, and you can just see fantastic racing all day. And the first race and the third race today are so exciting, along with all the uh, claiming clown races. So uh, we'll see how it plays out. I'm sort of agree with you in the opening leg of the of the Stronic, uh, excuse the Stronic Five. Thinking about yesterday of the early pick five with Uptown Flirt, but six to five to me, Jace, might be a little low. Yeah, it is early on. I mean, you've got an hour or sixty minutes on the uh, nose before the race begins, and I have no problem with everybody on paper falling in line behind this daughter of Spikester for Bill Mott. Again, it looked to me solid on the turf, if not outstanding, and it wasn't like she improved in each of her three races earlier this year in the Big Apple, yet quite simply, Ronnie, would you agree she's just simply the benchmark as far as prior turf form goes when you're looking at this field? Yeah, those were solid turf outings on the New York circuit. Bill Mott, and of course, you get uh, Tyler Gaffleone, who uh, seems to, he probably has a mansion by now in Kentucky. He won everything there. Coming back to his hometown, his daughter was Spitesters. With all that said, the one to beat. But li like you, my early pick five ticket, I would use more. Including, obviously, you like the firster from the rail for H. Graham that I that I prefer on top. And the one, Panagia Proxima, who's a, a Temple City homebred, uh, half the thread of blue. There's been some, some turf success on the uh, female side of the pedigree. You know, and I look, and I don't get too tied into who's riding who, but it does seem, Ronnie, looking at the percentages of Graham here at Gulfstream, when he's comfortable and confident enough to give Louie a leg up, it does seem like they do great work together, both Graham and Louie. Yeah, I mean, this is what you mentioned, a half-sister to Thread of Blue, and if you remember, Thread of Blue won both the Palm Beach and the Danube Beach Love over this turf course. course. So, Love this turf course. He was course. better here than anywhere else, I yeah. think. Yeah, so you, you factored it in when you handicapped and I had to put it in my ticket, and you actually put it on top. And Partisan Kitten, the daughter of Productive Turf Side Kittens Joy, debuting for Mike Maker, who's got about 400 horses in today, mm -hmm. and a ride is in the saddle. And, uh, uh, you know, the toad action is going to tell us more here. It's going to take some money, but I still think when the smoke clears, probably Uptown Flirt will be the favorite. Let's give a little love to Eliza Starr, who is just as tough as they make them. I mean, she is a true blue Florida bred and then some, an 11-time winner from 34 career races as we dive into the opening uh, claiming crown stake on the program. It's the $80,000 glass slipper, and she quite simply is the story of the race. We're going to backtrack and look at one of her big performances. In fact, if I recall, yep, last winter's glass slipper. I had really been worried, and I had a lot of trepidation going into to this race about her staying a mile and I remember we had talked to Peter Walder and had a pre-race interview with him and Peter said don't worry about the eight furlong she can get it and she did I guess my one real issue with her not that she's been awful this year I just think in hindsight and comparing I think she was a little sharper and she certainly won a lot more during her five-year-old season in 2019 and I just don't know for me it might not be like a 50% drop off not even close I just don't know if she's as good as she was in during the time period we just looked at with her glass slipper 12 months ago. Well, funny you said that. Uh, Peter came into our office this morning. I was talking to him about Liza Star, and he, I said, what, what do you think? He said, I'm, I'm a little concerned about the mile. Oh, quote, he is. The, so. Quote, unquote, is what he said this afternoon. He said if she can get out there and run, she can get the mile. But that was, he's a little concerned. Of course, you're getting Tyler Gaffleone in the saddle. So maybe flip-flopping him like you did with Sky Chaser on top might be the way to go. And, I mean, Ronnie, what about Sky Chaser, who's just, you know, you talk about a gem of consistency. We saw her throughout the spring and summer. And not only was she running well, it, it, it just looks like, and, and, I mean, the facts are there. The races are what they are on paper, she just kept getting better and faster and stronger as time went on for Ron Spatz. Well, she's back locally after following that sharp $25,000 optional claiming victory here with a game third place finish behind the next out stakes, what are called get gibberish. That was in that 62,500 optional claimer. Going that two-turn mile across town at Gulf Stream Park West, she is a major player in there, and uh, gibberish won some stake out of, I think, in Kentucky or at somewhere. Delta. Delta, Delta, Delta Downs, Downs, in fact. Yeah, last weekend for Safi. Yeah, for Safi. 
happy. That's right. So, you know, just keying off that Sky Chaser, Liza Star, maybe the distance, uh, maybe like you said, not as what she was last year. Maybe that's why there's some concern. And we both used the five. Don't get cozy. You're stretching out to the mile today. Close to finish third and second, respectively. Pair of sprints again, similar for Antonio Sano. How good is he going? And I was going to add, add a, a rad today on this daughter of Cozan. You can't leave this guy off your ticket. You can't. Four wins already <laughs> at the meet. I mean, we've only had three days, 30, 30 odd races here thus far, and Antonio's got four of them. And uh, yeah, we'll see how Don't Get Cozy does. Uh, she wants a dry track, which she gets today. I think at this level, a mile for her might be pushing it a little bit. She's going to need to be very good this afternoon, going maybe a little further than she wants to go, again, at a, a pretty high level, but she's a contender nonetheless in that second race. On to the third. We had the uh, two-year-old Phillies in the first. We'll bring on the two-year-old Colts in this uh, 50K made in special weight in Saturday's third. And another maxed out field and just excellent looking race. Uh, very much made up of out-of-town horses, including uh, two... two uh, uh, very mega connected uh, runners who coincidentally in fact in the in the course of uh, the eight fighting force uh, for for Todd and the number two voter protection being one two and and Ronnie boxing them up or him and I boxing them up you've got a little bit of history between uh, both these runners coming down from the Big Apple and as such we're going to look at that September 20th race off the bat with the two fighting force who didn't break terrible but he was off it looked like he brushed the right side of the gate out of the uh, starting apparatus and was just off a beat slow. He recovered. To his credit, he recovered pretty nicely. And although he had to go a little wide, more or less tracking in that three, three and a half, four path, he ran great. What caught my eye, though, was the fact that Chad's horse, who had no speed and never really had any great position, I like the way the four voter protection, although he did not run the better race, that clearly belongs to the two fighting fours. I like the way where these front running horses just weren't coming back. I really like the way voter protection ran in this spot and I am expecting just a far better, far even race second out. But I've got a lot of respect, Ronnie, for your top pick, who did run the better race in that affair we just looked at at Belmont Park. Yeah, just a beautifully bred son of Air Force Blue returning to the turf, follow that second place, finished behind that grade three for Trudy Stakes, winner second of July in his turf debut with that third place finish. That was uh, that race moved from the grass to eight and a half furlongs on the Keeneland main track. So Air Force Blue for me, voted protection, we just showed why. Now, horse today... I put a little further down, didn't put on my ticket today, but I pulled the stat on, was the four horse in here, uh, Fingal. I just wanted to show, because Spilmont has to do with the first race and this particular third race with his those mystic shippers into Gulfstream Park on the turf. He's 34 for 168, and to have a 20% win average is pretty good. 48% in the money and still a positive ROI. Just wanted to throw that out there this afternoon. I don't know what we're going to get from Finnegal this afternoon, but I just thought maybe I I'd throw that stat out for the folks. Yeah, I was Looking at that horse's uh, first race at Aqueduct, didn't get bet. Very soft ground that day. I mean, clearly caught a, a course that had taken a lot of rain. And I think like many Belmont firsters, uh, back on November 14th at <laughs> above 30 to 1, clearly was not go time. And I would imagine that horse is uh, uh, eligible to take a, a big step forward. He is the first horse, in fact, returning off that loss against uh, Original, who I noted wired the field in that aqueduct race back in the middle of last month. An interesting rematch and certainly a, a solid maiden turf race on the third, or in the third. Let's move on to the uh, fourth. We're in uh, claiming crown stakes from, from here on out, and uh, we'll bring on uh, a little short game action and uh, some fast sprinters as well in the uh, claiming crown express, uh, very much led by, fittingly, the inside posted horse and the one Christo Sky who has been a, a local star down here, and maybe that's a, a little little exaggerated, but he he really, between turf and then switching to the dirt, Ronnie, obviously over the summer, had his coming out party fairly late or second half of his eight-year-old season. I mean, he is not a, a young horse by any stretch, but, I mean, you look at his three races on the dirt successively for Carlos David, and this horse has been better than ever. Yeah, speedy son of City Zip. He's back in South Florida after following that set the pace second here. That was in the grade three smile. When he goes up, he sets the pace again, finishes fourth. But you're talking about in the grade three de Francis up at Pimlico, uh, Carlos David. I read in the saddle today, this is the inside speed, and he classes up 
perfectly in this spot against him. He has been facing some really fast horses. Looks like the one to beat now. I'm with you. No, he's going to be favored and should be favored from that inside post. But we're both fans, clearly, of the seven combination who just, I can't recall ever seeing a horse with one simple blinker addition turned into the kind of just <laughs> monster and wind machine that he has been throughout 2020. There's been a couple of non-efforts out of him, but by and large, he has just been just unbelievably consistent and a win machine. And I'll tell you, Ronnie, another thing, going back to his return race just a couple of weeks ago at GPW, I truly feel he had no right to win that race going five against a very speedy long blade. It was claimed out of that race by Mike Maker and is coming back in this spot. Yet I think that just underscored that return, how good combination is that he won a race that he probably shouldn't have. Got all the things I like in here, as you mentioned, a seven-time local winner who's stretching out to three quarters after that hard fourth score going five across town. It's Safi, it's Edgar, horse for course play for me in there. You have the four Y, you are awesome in a second, I have it in third. And I think this one sits the trip off the speed after tracking the pace and notching back-to-back -back victories using that stalk and pounce style. Winner of four of his last five races, Miguel Vasquez in the saddle. The faster they go up front, I believe the better it's going to be for the horse you having second and he's the elder statesman the soon-to-be 10 year old who just hits hard and uh, just a racehorse through and through uh, we get on to Jakarta she's going to be a big favorite here you picked her I picked her in fact you and I both taking Jakarta over Georgina's uh, mare the uh, soon-to-be eight-year-old the number nine thinking Cowtown who is the defending winner of this race and as good as thinking Cowtown was 12 months ago she did not beat a horse of Jakarta's quality, who Jakarta won that off the turf race when she won the powder break here mm -hmm. in mid-May, and then she went out of town and clearly was tangling with better horses in deeper fields than this one, and I really think reached ahead, and that kind of culminated with an effort will bring you from back on October the 9th when she was beaten a length by... I'm not going to say a Hall of Famer, but, I mean, you talk about a classy sprinter slash miler. I mean, it's 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 hard to knock a horse when you're finishing a length behind Got Stormy, who's starting to roll in those pink sleeves. Yeah, Got Stormy, a classy grade one winner. That was just the Buffalo Trace. And just a, if you key off that performance, this sort of bust and zone certainly looks like the class of the field off those performances. And who this horse has been running against there, you see just a good performance. Uh, I, I pulled a, spat, a stat on. Mike Maker with your card. When horses are going from synthetic to turf, which this horse is doing, 5 for 20, uh, 5, 20 percent, 40 percent, 187 is the return of investment. All right, that's Jakarta. What are we looking for with the nine thinking Cowtown? She didn't get bet, ran fine against a uh, a very gritty sprinter who's won a lot of races here on this circuit, say the last three or four months in airball. I think I think she's going to show up with a very good effort this afternoon. I really do the nine thinking Cowtown. Well, she's the defending champ, and the dash was given some time off after finishing third in that turf sprint here in September. Hard knocking mare. She runs exceptionally well fresh. She's going to have Tyler Gaffleone in the saddle, who was aboard for this victory in this race last year. So they're trying to catch lightning in a bottle again. And I like this horse when it runs fresh. And I went with the seven who you have in fourth and third, DeLonga, who's uh, going to the Carlos David Barney. Going to really have to step it up this afternoon, but look at the connections you have with Carlos and with Arad in the saddle. All right, as we take a little breather here from the Breeders' Cup Dirt Mile, it's 60-1 to 1 to a big favorite in the Jewel. It's Jesus' team after the break. One of our favorite vistas from the clubhouse turn and some last-minute preparations being done to the main track following a fairly 
crowded and eventful uh, Saturday morning training. Ronnie and I both got to uh, Gulfstream Park around 9.30, and uh, they were buzzing over this main track this morning. Uh, the backstretch here in Hallandale Beach, Palm Meadows, and Gulfstream Park West are filled to capacity, and you get a sense of that looking at basically one 12-horse field after another on this opening Saturday program of the championship meet. Jason and Ronnie back for segment number two, and for good reason, Ronnie, we've got we've got a lot of ground to cover. Six more claiming crown stakes led by the Rainbow Six opener, which features an odds-on favorite in all likelihood named Jesus' team. Yeah, this is the big race of the day. The June 150,000 guaranteed. I didn't just sing in Jesus' team. I used Dak Daniels, one of my favorite favorite named horses running there, but I really like this horse for Jack Sisterton, and, and I went too deep in the opening leg, three deep. I, I like Muggsmatic to come back in that race, Tusk and Temple also in that race, in race number eight this afternoon. Here's my long shot, Avant Garde. I'm going to try and upset that 15-1. to one. This horse loves to win when tried the Oklahoma Derby last. I think this one could run well. Uh, the 12 horse also in there in the five miles ahead. In the Tiara, which is race number nine, I went too deep with Queen's Embrace and Sugar Fix in the 10th race. My best bet is the five Tiger Blood. I'm thinking that horse is going to come back at 6-1. to one. And I also used Unmoored. And in the last... Oh, no fire. No fire for you, no, huh? No, no. I'm going wow. with that. And then in the last, Frost or Frippy, Snap Hook, and Bobby G. Yeah, I like the same three horses in the uh, last. Uh, Snaphook has uh, become one of my favorite local horses and uh, do think he's going to run a big one this afternoon in the nightcap, but you've got the Brad Cox invader. Oh, I'm curious why you uh, don't particularly <laughs> care for Fi. Like, I kind of <laughs> like that you're bullish enough or confident enough that you left him off your uh, your Rainbow Six ticket. Uh, he's going to be a big favorite. He, uh, he, I think that's the 10th race, right? Yeah, I picked him third, but right. I mean, it's just I, 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 well, I think I like those two horses in there. Well, well that, that's the beauty of this ticket at 4320. You like that horse? You had it I on do. Your I do. I singled him in my uh, my late pick five. I, like I think he's tough as a big favorite. You know, and that clearly is like the undercurrent in this opening leg of the Rainbow Six, which I guess in a way, depending upon your stance, as we look at the uh, the field of this uh, this cast of eight and the one hundred fifty thousand dollar jewel, uh, very much led off by the uh, six to five morning line favorite and Jesus's team. Depending upon how you feel about a horse who clearly is on the record at using this race as a dress rehearsal of sorts and springboard, you know, do you view this Rainbow Six as more of a Rainbow Pick 5? And, um, you know, it's just hard to argue. I know he's a little bit of a grinder and a little bit of a plotter, and at times maybe that's not the best style to have here at Gulfstream, but when you go through and clearly see who Jesus's team has been running against and just that overachieving nature. He's a he's a tough horse to really, I think on paper anyway, deny the victory to. And as such, we're going to look at his uh, last out win where uh, he closed up the rail. It's a little tough to see with the uh, with the NBC camera, but there he is in those Hunter Green Group 07 Sea Silks down inside uh, chasing uh, the Brad Cox horse in, uh, in Nick's go, just ran off the screen in the dirt mile. Uh, but you'll see Jesus's team as he has done numerous times this year, chugging along and refusing to, to get beat for a minor award in a grade one race. And it's just, it's pretty wild, Ronnie, looking at the fact that Jose D'Angelo first had this horse on May 8th, won a two lifetime 25K claimer with him, and then boom, it was off and running with nonstop grade ones and grade twos for the run up into the claiming crown today. Yeah, but you make a great point that, you know, this horse's running style is really not conducive to what we usually see here at Gulfstream Park. And the reason I didn't single him in on my ticket, I mean, I didn't go deep. I really respect him. I got him on top of my ticket. But I can understand the horse I, that I like in second, and that's the seven, Dak Daniels, who's turning back to the mile in an eighth after dueling for the lead and finishing third. That was in the 13 fur, furlong uh, grade two alliance, uh, uh, have to care alliance. They changed the name of that race at Keeneland, Jack Sisseton, a really nice guy, and Julian Leperu named to ride. Maybe this horse gets a job done in there, but, I mean, it's Jesus' team race to lose. It absolutely is. He doesn't have as much speed as a Jack's horse in the mix, and we had mentioned it briefly yesterday. I, I think it's fascinating that the overall, just that underdog and, and crazy underdog type status and storyline of Jesus' team, it's the antithesis of that today. He's the big favorite. He is sort of the, uh, you know, uh, light up name on the marquee horse uh, regarding all the claiming crown races today, and the pressure 
I'm sure there's been pressure with Jose just running this horse at a very high level, but it's a different kind of pressure today, and we'll obviously see what happens there uh, midway through the card in race number six. We start the late pick five in Saturday's seventh race. We're on the turf of the Emerald. I, for me, Ronnie, on just like a, a depth basis, I think this is the best race on today's card, the opening leg of this late pick five. This is really a, an outstanding field of turf horses, uh, led, of course, by muggs who's your defending winner, and you've got Sappy's horse in Tusk, who ran well in this race a year ago and then would go on to win the Tropical Turf before having surgery, and he's back off the layoff today. I wanted breathing room because I don't think muggs is as good as he was even a few months earlier, and I just don't know what Tusk is going to do off that long layoff in such a solid field. So I included the uh, numbers, uh, number four horse Temple, who's my top pick, as well as Hieroglyphics. Uh, five horses, Ronnie, in that opening leg for Mike Maker. Yeah, five horses, <laughs> and one on the also eligible list. I don't know if it's been scratched yet, so he's actually got six in the race right now. So uh, he's got his bases covered, as they say. Miles Ahead is my top pick in the uh, eighth race. I don't think he liked the Gulfstream West main track last out. He never looked comfortable to me, and to his credit, still got up to win, and uh, I do like him coming home to a track he's based at, and Safi's done well with Yoda Leihu. Uh, race number nine, I think Bienville Street, if there's a, a price horse to be had, I do think she's going to run a big race this afternoon. That race, to me, though, may have been the most modest looking on paper. And as such, the Danny Gargan new claim uh, in that spot looks dangerous, as well as the 11 uh, Sugar Fix with uh, Danny running the five, my top pick, Queen's Embrace. You know I like the favorite, Faya, who's just been on a, on a, on a steamroll-type campaign regarding his turf sprints. They've been just fast. They've been powerful, and he has not come close to losing. And we'll see how he does as a, as a clear favorite in the Canterbury and wrapping it up with uh, my boy Snap Hook and the uh, Brad Cox Invader. As uh, we're going to see, Ron, I mean, today's kind of the, you know, the little bit of uh, dipping your big toe in, in the water here locally at Gulfstream for Brad, who for the first time in what is turning out to be a, a, a Hall of Fame-worthy career <laughs> like that, uh, he's got a 30-horse string on this circuit based up at Palm Meadows. So I do think... You know, as a sidebar, it'll be interesting to see how his horses do here off the bat because this is the first winter he's been stabled here at Gulfstream Park. You would think with just the numbers he's putting up around the country and the horses tend to show some speed. That's all he he's thinks. He's probably going to be 40%. <laughs> yeah, you're that's right. That's what I'm saying. You know, he's got the horses that can run well in this spot. So uh, I'm sure he'll uh, be successful here in South Florida. So let's start with muggs -Omatic. I've got him second. You've got him third. I just said my one issue, and it's a similar set sentiment to what I had with the Liza star back in the second. I just don't know over the last two races or so if muggs is as good as he was, say, back in late winter, early summer. Uh, he does love this turf course, and as such, Ronnie, I did give him the benefit of the doubt. What do you like about him in this upcoming race? Well, besides being a defending champ, he's turning back to the mile, makes his second start since an ambitious summer uh, campaign in which he followed his victory here in the Soldier's Dancer with a yeoman's try in the Grade 1 United Nations, followed by a third-place finish uh, against Starter Allowance Company up at Kentucky Downs. He's been all over the place, as we mentioned, Mike Maker, a lot of starters in here. I'm going with the thing that that I've been with successful over the last couple of days. The old horse for course angle with mugs I think he's been knocking heads with some serious competition, and I'm going to give him a chance to rebound, uh, maybe in a little uh, softer spot. You mentioned Tusk uh, coming off, a lay off the operation, whatever he had in Temple. You know, this might be a spot for mugs to uh, make it two in a row. And then, you know, Safi's horse, Tusk, and you'll hear from Safi a bit later on. And, and Safi said this horse is training like his old self. Uh, he was hoping not to catch a field as deep as this one is <laughs> off that layoff. And I said, no, I absolutely, I couldn't agree more. I'm not a horse trainer, but it's a very tough spot to come back in. And, uh, yeah, we'll see what Tusk can do. You know, the Fort Temple, though, Ronnie, likes it here. I get a lot of these horses in this race and put up some big numbers. So the fact that he's four for eight at Gulfstream, maybe you take a little bit with a grain of salt because a lot of these horses have impressive resumes local over this turf course. But, you know, he, he tends to run well all the time. I do like, I just like the form of Temple, and he's going to be a slightly higher price than, of course, Muggs and, uh, and Tusk in that race. Yeah, you know, and I have him on my ticket, and Tyler Gaffley only being the saddle. He's my third choice 
choice in the race. I think he has a major chance in here. So uh, uh, I, I agree. It's a, it's a very competitive race and one of the most fun races on the card. Let's move on to the eighth. We've got the rapid transit on the dirt coming up. We'll go seven furlongs. Your long shot's in the mix, who I've got fourth. And you know what? Even though he's going to be a, a fair price in this spot, let's let's start out with Avant Guard, who, you know, do you think maybe he didn't like the sloppy track last time out at 20 cents? Because he really struggled to win that race a few weeks ago at GPW. Well, you know, we know he's no slouch in the wind department. He certainly got back to his winning ways last out after that four-race win streak ended when he finished fourth in the grade three Oklahoma Derby. Uh, you know, it's going to be, you know, you're going to get a price because this was a tough spot for him today. I mean, against this level of competition, I just had so much fun watching him run throughout the summer. No, I beating all too. sorts of horses. Up. Uh, you know, 15 to one in the morning line. I figure that's where I'll go with my long shot today. Yeah, I don't want to knock him because he's a, a big price. And no. I, I like him too. I'm a fan of avant-garde as well. I would hope, though, going into this race today that it was a case of him not liking the, that main track or the sloppy going or maybe a little bit of a combination of both uh, because his last race, I'm hoping, or at least wondering, put it that way, you know, did the clock kind of strike midnight for this horse because he... In a five-horse field that he laid over, and he wound up paying $2.40 to win. I mean, he barely beat Hero Tiger, and that no. was a win that was very much in doubt until the last few yards. So did he not like the slop? Is he tailing off? Uh, we'll find out this afternoon from that inside post. Uh, you know, speaking of not particularly caring for the track at Gulfstream West, the five miles ahead, who has just, I mean, been like a rocket this year for Eddie Plisa Jr., this horse... I mean, boom, broke his mane for 12-5, and for the most part, outside of, of a, a couple of lackluster efforts in March and late April, which he was able to come back from winning three straight, I mean, he's been nothing short of spectacular this year, and he just... He looked to me, Ronnie, last time out that he was off the bridle and Paco basically had to ride him every step of the way and he still got up to win. I'm going into this thinking he's a much better horse from his home base, and this is a home game for him. Yeah, ultra consistent, as you mentioned, with Paco in the saddle. I just wanted to touch on the number 12 in here, Ama G6, who has claimed twice recently, in the last time by Todd Pletcher, for $62,500, cuts back to seven furlongs after encountering trouble and finishing fourth behind a pricey stablemate, uh, Todd Weege, going a mile in the slop here last time out. Just keep going back to this horse that they ran in. They grabbed him for 62500 Todd doesn't claim many horses mm -hmm. it completely. This yep. son of alternation will have Irad in the saddle. Just something about this horse. I don't know if you, uh, Pete put had him price on. Is he's, he? he's got him the morning line favorite. Which oh, I, he does. Yeah. Okay. Just curious about to see how that horse runs. Yeah, we'll see. He's an interesting <laughs> player for sure. I didn't love his Florida form, but yeah, I mean, Todd jumping in clear. You would imagine <laughs> when they claimed this horse in late September, you would imagine they had their eye on this yeah, race, trying to make race. the claiming crown with him. And uh, he'll go from the outside post in a very interesting eighth race. Uh, as I was saying earlier with my late pick five, I, I don't know how much depth there really is in the tiara. And I think a lot of people, yeah, sure enough, I mean, you and I have an ice cold super, 5'11", <laughs> 1-7 in an 11-horse turf race. And I think going in, most, a large chunk of this field is very much about Sappy's runner, the 11 sugar fix on the outside, and, of course, the uh, Danny Gargan high-priced $80,000 claim in the five Queens Embrace. Yeah, third in the grade two leg, Placid up at the spa in July, moved to Danny's barn after that claim. Uh, you know, ran fifth in that $80,000 optional claimer, but the barn is really good with new claims. Jumping in and grabbing this horse, probably, like you said, uh, maybe claim for this exact race this afternoon. We'll see. Let's move on to uh, Faya coming up there. Dave Rodman, if you haven't listened to the call, <laughs> the Maryland Turf Spread Handicap, hop on YouTube, do yourself a favor. I won't do it justice, but Dave, Dave They've knocked it out of the park with that with that call, and this horse wound up paying 220 to boot in that uh, last out race at Laurel Park. In fact, here it is. Had I had, if I had a brain, Ronnie, I would have pulled this with the audio so yeah. we could listen to Dave because he did a great job. I thought for a horse that was just an overwhelming uh, uh, favorite and kind of a formality when he, uh, I guess, when he showed up in this race and again was uh, one to nine. Uh, you know, this horse's turf sprints have just been been awesome. And I remember watching this because Rob Massiello, great guy, good buddy of mine. You know, I was thinking, having watched this race live back on October 24th, you know, if they would consider maybe taking a look at the Breeders' Cup turf sprint at Keeneland. They clearly, though, went the, the safer route, if you will. And uh, I'm going into this 
just really loving this horse is obviously amazing record thus far on the turf and I'm saying he's the goods I'm trying to wire this thing you're not as in love with him you're taking the five tiger blood who does love it here at Gulfstream yeah you know an eight-time local winner's hoping the weather will cooperate which it is you can see with a beautiful day he catch he caught yielding or soft turf in a trio of recent races Mike Maker has Tyler Gaffleone to top this 19-time winner I think he's going to run well on the firm turf course this afternoon yep. three in a row on really soft mm -hmm. and yielding turf not his game Game. Tiger Bud bounces back six to one on the morning line this afternoon. Unmoored, and you know, the one fire, a uh, really consistent Maryland bred for Tommy Albatroni, who we both love. Louis Saez rode him in New York, so probably the one to beat in there, but you know, I gotta take a couple of swings somewhere. All right. So Tiger Blood is my horse. Yeah, I don't know about probably the horse to beat. <laughs> he is unequivocally the horse to beat, but no, I think we've Tiger, been saying that a lot over the we last have, couple of Well, there, there's some favorites for sure today. Right. I'm not saying they have to win, right. but you know, you do have with Hayes. Jesus's team and a few other horses. I mean, you've got, you've clearly got a situation that that is continuous today, where there are some marquee horses and Fire is one of them. But I'm with you with Tiger Blood. Firm ground, five eighths is his best trip. I don't think he really wants to go much further than five. I really don't. Yeah. And he loves it here at Gulfstream. No, he should show up with a good race. Uh, we'll wrap things up here as far as the uh, the 11 race uh, card is concerned. And uh, we end things, what, at 5.06 Eastern with the Iron Horse. Let's start with Brad Cox's uh, horse on the rail, your top pick in Frost or Frippery. You know, Brad has only run nine horses here at Gulfstream over a five-year span. He's won four of them. What do you make of this horse who's just clearly beaten up on al allowance optional claiming runners uh, out of town? Well, he's been odds-on choice in the seven races since claimed claim by Bob, uh, Brad Cox. Uh, debuts locally after winning five of seven of those in races. Impressive fashion. He's a fashion. He's a ten-time winner at the distance, and he's got Louis Sayers, and uh, you know that sort of jumps off the page for me. But Snap Hook, you expect to run well. That's why I used all three horses that I had in there on top of my ticket. He is one of the gamest horses, Snap Hook, running in South Florida. And, uh, I mean, it's just how the game goes. He was, I mean, he won He won the battle and lost the war last time. I really think he was comfortably three lengths better than Geonosis, but that pace with Brasstown just enabled him to get picked off late. I, I like Snap Hook this afternoon and obviously respect Brad's horse from that inside post, which now brings us to our lightning round on this opening Saturday, Claiming Crown Day 2020 here at Gulfstream Park. And I, I love, Ronnie, this first topic of business we're going to get to. And that concerns the the ageless wonder Hall of Famer Edgar Prado, who liked winning so much yesterday, he didn't do it once, like in the second race with Took a Cab. He did it twice. 7,091 victories for him. And I mean the stats with Edgar are just unbelievable. Eighth all time in victories. Yeah, he's just and he's riding in real good form uh, uh, throughout the whole summer. And I, I keep teasing him all the time. Every time I see him, how's the grass out there? And he answers, green. That's the most I ever get out of him. Yeah. But he's just uh, a good guy, and uh, he's been doing good. Yeah, ambassador, always uh, been a, a great ambassador for racing. And uh, and three mounts on today's card, including a horse in the first for Hall of Famer Edgar Prado. Uh, we have a, a couple of uh, future Hall of Famers, and at this rate, first ballot Hall of Famers making their triumphant returns locally today. Uh, the first of which is Tyler Gaffleone, who unequivocally is the local boy done good around these parts. Grew up just a few furlongs here from Gulfstream Park in Davie, Florida. He's got an Eclipse Award as champion apprentice. And you look down, Ronnie, I mean, he has got stats this year, almost 250 wins, nearly 15 million in purses. He's third in the nation in purse money one. And there he is aboard Zulu Alpha in last year's Pegasus Turf. Yeah, I heard the guys in the office saying he won all six Churchill Downs <laughs> titles and the Churchill Downs Kentucky titles. I don't know if that's true, but it's amazing. Just been in great form. And he's your upset to be leading uh, Ryder here. Yeah, I'm going with Tyler <laughs> to buck the trend of Arad and uh, Louie finishing 1-2. I think Tyler's going to have a gigantic winter down here. Now, here is, in fact, your defending two-time Gulfstream Park winter meet champion returning in the saddle today in Arad Ortiz Jr., who already has a couple of Pegasus wins. There he is on uh, bricks and mortar in that first ever Pegasus turf. Mucho gusto a year ago. And I mean, the stats, Ronnie, uh, just even that last nugget I pulled, what he's done in 2020. And keep in mind, he also took around five or six weeks off when COVID first hit. Uh, just staggering numbers. Staggering numbers. And he ended up uh, 
beating Louie by one in the training standing, uh, jockey standings here, and he took some time off. So uh, amazing. It it's is amazing. amazing. I love also, you know, we, we opened up the lightning round with the longevity of a guy like Edgar Prado. And I think in many respects that holds true for the likes of Mike Maker, who just, I mean, when you, you look at the operation this guy has built up, he is running, I think, 13 horses. He's got a baker's dozen on today's card. Let me ask you this, though. <laughs> Who's the more likely winner today? Is it Jakarta or muggs with the two Maker runners? Oh, well, you would think Jakarta, but I'm going to go with muggs because I picked muggs on top. So, But uh, I picked them both, actually, on top. So he might get both wins there. But Jakarta's the, 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 really the one to beat, I would believe in that. Because muggs we mentioned, uh, you know, maybe not on his A game right now, but knocking heads with some tough customers. And you've got another dance in the claiming crown and, and very much taking a page from the kind of uh, durability of an Edgar Prado or the Operation Makers built. And uh, wishing best of luck to uh, Leia Tone, Liza Star, mugs and thinking Cowtown. It's pretty neat, Ronnie, where you've got nine claiming crown races today, four defending winners showing up to try to do it once again here at Gulfstream. So kudos to the connections getting those four horses back to the starting gate. Yeah, I mean, it's just amazing that, uh, you know, that's what uh, we love about these hard-knocking claimers. They don't miss many dances. How about some prices? Again, we, we already stated the two non-stakes today claiming crown races. You've got race one, race three. They're both maxed out, loaded, made in turf races for two-year-olds. I'm curious, uh, any any prices, Ronnie, in the first end or third race for you? Well, in race one, I, I like the four a little bit. Caribbean Bean Mocha, who's the daughter of Uncle Mo, debuting for Brian Lynch. I just love the breeding on that horse. I think 10 to 1 on the morning line, and it's just other ways to go. So that was the horse I thought I was going to give a, a second look. I have him picked on my ticket a little further down, but I think if he gets things right, and, you know, I don't have to tell you how I, you know how good Uncle Moe's run on the grass. So uh, I just thought maybe he would be a little bit of price, or she would be a little bit of price, excuse me. Fair enough. Race three for me, I think the inside horse, Conrad the Red, who's got an older turf sibling who coincidentally was trained by Mark Cassie, has got a right to run in his second start. And the number seven some Mo. Speaking of Uncle Mo, uh, this horse is 12 to 1 in the uh, program today, and uh, H. Graham has trained just about everybody in the family, including a full older sibling and sister named Ultra Brat, who uh, just missed beating Sister Charlie a few summers back in the Diane. I think both the 1 and 7 in race 3 can make some noise today at prices. Will we see some prices, my friend, in today's Rainbow Six? What do you think? We did yesterday. We had one uh, $80, whatever it was, horse in there. So 84 bucks, 84 right, with bucks. Antonio. Yeah. Yeah, $250,000 jackpot guarantee. That just adds. That's like the cherry on top of all the great races here. That You could also take down two hundred and fifty grand in a Rainbow Six. And once again, fast firm. Here's your live shot. 1142 with 23 minutes to race number one. You could not ask for a better day for Thoroughbred Racing here in South Florida. We're glad all of you are with us. We really appreciate it. As we take a little time out, Ronnie and I will rejoin all of you about 15 minutes before the first. We got to go up to Pete, the big man upstairs, for those claiming crown scratches and changes.